we managed to uh, get people who uh, liked each other who enjoyed working with each other who were, who were passionate about the mission of what we were trying to achieve so i think uh, because you are going to go through a lot right you're going to go through ups you're going to go through downs uh, and it's useful uh, to be with people that you actually like and who share your mission and your uh, passion so you know having a longer term view of this um, and not a very short term uh, view helps a lot Hello and welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. Back in 2013, EdTech was a very nascent space and the consumer mindset shift that we see right now, where online learning is front and center, hadn't really happened yet. It was in these circumstances that Arjun Nair and his co-founders started Great Learning, which they bootstrapped in a 10-year journey to a $600 million acquisition by Baiju's last year. In this conversation, I tried to understand from Arjun what they did to pioneer that change in consumer attitudes um, what are some opportunities that he sees in the domain right now and of course how to build a bootstrapped and profitable enterprise in a space that attracted about 4.7 billion dollars of funding last year this is a fascinating conversation with an experienced entrepreneur plenty of insights in here that you can learn from i'm sure you'll like it so let's get started on this episode of the startup popular podcast with arjun nair hey arjun welcome to the startup popular podcast thank you so much for making the time Thanks Roshan it's great to be here. Yeah uh, so Arjun I I'd love to talk about the uh, domain in which you operate you know I mean today edtech and online learning is mainstream but when great learning started uh, I think it was a different era you know Coursera and Udemy had just started I think a couple of years before you guys and the world was still not aware of the phenomenal potential of online learning and uh, edtech and MOOC and so on right so what were some of the early challenges that you had to face and what went into changing that consumer mindset yeah no it's a it's a great start and uh, when i think back right it's actually been quite a while since we've been we've been in the in the business so we launched our first course in 2013 uh, but i think uh, we started thinking about uh, what to launch and how to put it together from 2012 so pretty much uh, as you said a decade uh, we've been operating in the space there was coursera there was uh, udacity at that point udemy i think um, edx was just getting started so you know when we think of all of those companies and the biggest uh, let's say the word at that time was moocs right so i'm sure everybody here is familiar with what what are called moocs so moocs was what it what was what was a big thing there so when we looked at the space and we looked at uh, moocs and the success that moocs were having it was actually really hot right moocs were really hot you know millions of learners from pretty much every part of the world getting access to high quality content so moocs solved a specific aspect of education which was that uh, you suddenly had access to high quality content right so that's what moocs solved but there was another aspect right let's say that is the first problem to solve which is just get access to people access to content um, and access to high quality faculty high, access to high quality assessments MIT also started with an initiative called MIT Open Courseware which is just they put all their lectures online yeah. so everybody was experimenting with online education right and because everyone knew that other than at the best universities in the world rest of the world really didn't have high quality faculty or high quality content or high quality assessments so MOOCs solved that problem now the part that MOOCs did not solve and the parts that when you know and the part that when we looked at the space we thought was an opportunity was really about how do you create outcomes so let's say the first real challenge that we picked up and looked at solving was uh, to take it from that point on and say you know how do you create outcomes especially in a world that is very very rapidly changing so at that point everybody was talking about and still do talking about the fourth industrial revolution how multiple technologies are coming together whether it's ai ml um you know um and may, and all of these um, aspects around cloud computing connected devices iot you know sensors there's so many different technologies coming together and it's all getting ap- applied in business and the half life of knowledge is changing so fast and that's the space that we looked at and how do you how do you actually do something here when things are changing so rapidly you have to leverage online but it was not clear at all in 2013 and 2012 and 2014 for that matter how do you create outcomes online so uh, most people don't know this but great learning's history started as we had offline centers 
So we grew as an offline company where our first center was in Gurgaon. We started with about 20 to 30 learners. I think it was 25 or 30 learners in our Gurgaon center, which was basically teaching these uh, latest cutting edge technologies, which was needed for the digital age. We leveraged content, which was online. Assessments were done online. We followed an approach which was very similar to a flipped classroom model, where we gave a lot of material for students to prepare and learn while they're away. And when they came to class, we created an atmosphere of peer interaction. You can learn from an inspirational faculty. You could do your projects together. You get to know each other. So many of those aspects we were able to create in an offline world. And we really learned how to have these pieces where offline and online can work together and what are the best aspects of offline education, uh, which is appropriate for lifelong learning. And when you have people are not there fully on campus, what are the best aspects of offline education that you can move online? And only much later, a couple of years down the line, two, three years down the line is when we actually figured out how do you take outcome-oriented education online and what are the you know, central pieces for that? So many aspects now that you see happening, whether it's uh, cohort-based learning, peer interaction, group projects and assessments delivered online, mentorship and mentored online, you know, many, many aspects of those pieces that had to come together. And even what we talk about in this flipped classroom approach, all of those aspects together just was was the evolution. When we look at, let's say now, when we we look at what is the evolution of EdTech, it's really about how do you create outcomes online? And that is the piece that a lot of the companies today solved from MOOCs to actually creating outcomes. And when I mean outcomes, I'm, I'm talking about mastering hard concepts. So how does a person who doesn't know a deep technology like, you know, machine learning or AI or cloud computing or full stack development, how do you learn that? So as you would have gone and, you know, if you had gone to a master's program or a one year undergraduate program, if you had gone there and you learned it. How do you actually learn that remotely and have sufficient depth to make a career change for the next four or five years and then be able to work in an intense technology uh, environment with peers who probably have a master's degree, a full-time master's degree? How do you actually do that? So that's the piece that we solve for. And uh, several companies were attempting to solve it. I think a few people have also solved it. Uh, But that's the piece that we solve for. We're creating outcomes online. And a lot of the challenges were about that, the pieces that I talked about. How do you enable peer interaction to happen online? Because without peer interaction and peer learning, people can't sustain motivation for you know, six months, nine months. And it takes that much time to actually master something. How do you have inspirational um, you know, conversations with faculty? Because you, know, you need a great faculty to inspire you and demystify really hard topics. Then, of course, a faculty can only reach about, you know, uh, let's say, 40, 50, 100 people. But if you have thousands of people If you have hundreds and thousands of people or tens of thousands of people, how do you scale this model? So the concept of mentored learning, having cohorts of small groups where there is a mentor or an expert who's actually guiding you through a specific uh, example, whereas the faculty is actually doing one part of it. The mentor is filling the gaps of providing interaction, clarifying doubts, answering questions, facilitating engagement and so on. How do you actually engage somebody online, right? Because that itself is a pretty, pretty hard task. Right, Because if I just sit here and lecture, it will become very boring. How do you do hands-on exercises? Because you can't learn a lot of this without doing things hands-on. How do you create a, a, an environment where you can do a project, where you can a problem walk, a, you can implement a problem, so discuss with your mentor and get feedback for them. So what kind of an environment will enable that to happen? How do you grade tens of thousands of assessments in a single week and provide personalized feedback? Right. So these are all, you know, not, these are not trivial problems and none of these problems, by the way, MOOCs to Coursera never tried to solve that problem. Most of the MOOCs, the way the way they looked at solving problems were here's high quality content. It is a faculty from MIT or Stanford or wherever high quality faculty is recording content. Here are the assignments that they are going to give. And here is a model solution. You attempt the assignment on your own and go check your results against the model solution. Right. So that's basically all MOOCs could do. But all the things that I talked about earlier are what actually creates outcomes. And that's what has happened in the last, you know, when you think about this evolution of edtech in the last, at least in our space, you know, this is different in other spaces, but in our our space, when we think about evolution of edtech in the last decade or so, it's about how did you go from MOOCs to outcome oriented education where somebody can get a job. And today, hundreds of people actually get a job on our platform every week. 
So every week, about 100 people, more than 100 people are getting a job by going through the courses and then, you know, and then, you know, getting a job at, at a company in one of these hard tech areas. So it's pretty cool to be able to do that. And also having, having seen this and solving some of these hard challenges. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, pretty phenomenal to have seen this evolution up close. I want to touch upon something that you brought up, right? Which is when you talk about education in India, it's often the, the biggest financial investment for a family, right? And it's also seen as a means to an end. And so the average expectation after doing a course is that obviously that, you know, you will learn and transform and, you know, be educated and everything, but it'll also help you find a, find a job and earn a living, right? But I find that it's a hard thing to optimize for because if you overly optimize for employability, then, you know, the course that you teach or the content becomes extremely superficial, right? But at, at the same time, that, that's a key consideration for a candidate as well. So I wonder how you sought to strike that balance between, you know, learning and employability. See, ultimately, the way we think about this space is that, you know, somebody who is willing to pay for one of our courses and our courses, if you know our platform, our course is not, none of our courses are cheap, right? So we don't do anything superficial. So most of our programs run from uh, three to six months and, and actually sometimes much longer from six months to one year. And we even have masters, let's say a degree program that we do with Northwestern University, which is a top tier university um, in, the, in the US and the master's degree that we do with them is 18 months long. So, you know, and then it, and the price range for these programs, as you talked about, is a significant investment. It all the way goes from, you know, one, two lakhs for this Northwestern degree program. It actually costs 15 lakhs. Right. So these are not um, these are not trivial decisions that somebody makes. Um, you know, on the spur of the moment, it's a, it's probably a once or twice in a lifetime investment uh, that someone is actually taking. So we have that thought at the back of our mind throughout that uh, when somebody is taking this investment, they're actually looking for a specific outcome. And that outcome is very rarely just learning outcomes. Somebody is not doing this just for, very few people do. We do get some folks who come in and say that, hey, I just want to know what's happening in the field of data science. I'm just passionate about it and I'm learning. But Almost everybody or majority of the population would be coming to do one of these courses for a career outcome. Now, that career outcome could be many different things. It could be, you know, transitioning into a different role, like say somebody is working in engineering or somebody is working as a, as a quality assistant and now wants to work in data science or wants to move into digital marketing or whatever. So they want to switch their career. That could be one outcome. Or somebody might have four or five years of experience in a certain marketing role. And now they want to use, you know, analytics and data science and you know other techniques to help them do better and grow further in their in their jobs, right? So that could that can also be an outcome, right? And the third outcome could be something entirely different, where someone is trying to get, you know, start a company or meet people, like-minded people, and then get into a consulting kind of a um, kind of a uh, outcome. Or it could be many many different ways in which someone looks at this or build capability, especially we we've got a lot of senior folks who come into the program with 15, 20 years of experience, the outcome for them is maybe they are looking to build a certain capability within their organization, a data science team for that matter, right? So, so outcome is actually based on each person's own interest and, and life, life stage as well as their aspirations as to what is the outcome that they have to define for themselves. But the reason why I brought all this up is that everybody who takes this kind of investment in time, energy, money, all the sacrifices that they're doing is actually looking for an outcome, a career outcome, right? So we have to do that. And it's also important that you ask the question, how do you do that um, by uh, not just making it, a, you know, you can't, you know, one way to generate an outcome is to say that, all right, let's actually curate the list of top interview questions and then just give answers to people so that they just learn that and crack an interview. But, you know, that doesn't make sense because that's not what we, define as outcome, but or as, we, as I talked about earlier, a career outcome is something that helps you succeed for the next several uh, years, four, five, um, 10 years and sets you up for a long-term success, right? So with that career outcome in mind, you have to actually get much beyond the superficial aspects. You have to understand depth and you have to understand the concepts. You have to understand how to apply the con concepts. You have to get hands-on, you have to build that muscle memory. So a lot of this actually is easier to explain to somebody who's got five, 10 years of work experience. They understand it. They make the connection. You know, I get the career outcome only after I invest the time, energy, um, and effort into, into learning all these concepts and building hands-on skills, especially if you're very young and very early in your career, 
many people don't understand that. And it's important for us to communicate that. And that's what we do as part of our marketing events. That's what we do as part of our recruitment process. And once they come into the program, we communicate that a lot. And in fact, you know, unfortunately in, in India, and you brought this up, a lot of people have gone through very poor educational uh, institutions and you know environments where uh, their idea of what is effort is actually extremely skewed. Where you know they were um, going to class and not really paying much much attention and 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 took the shortcut by copying some answer from somewhere and passed the exams. You know, it, a lot. I'm not saying a lot of them are like that, but there are quite a few who are like that. And you know, for them now to now to then realize that okay, that kind of an approach, that kind of an attitude doesn't help me succeed in life. And to actually now participate in the in all the great excitement that's going on in the world right now with the digital economy, you actually need to put in the effort and you need to go through a structured part and you actually need to do all of these things. It takes a little bit of time for them to understand that, but you know we kind of club it down them and um, eventually they get it and they see their peers having outcomes and they uh, they a lot of them. I don't say I don't I don't think we make a convert of everybody, but a lot of them change. A lot of them go through the process and uh, get the outcomes that they're looking for right so that's what we say it's like uh, you know you you if you are putting willing to put in the effort we'll show you the path that you need to take and if you take that path and if you put in the effort you actually get the career outcome that you're looking for so i think there is a way to marry both the uh, the job oriented aspects of making sure that you have the skills that are required to get a get a job as well as making sure that there is sufficient depth so that it's not just about cracking an interview it's actually much beyond that, you know. Of course, you need to crack the interview, but also you need to succeed on your uh, on your job on your job, and not just succeed on your job in the first, let's say, six months, one year. But you've also built a foundation, and you've got now a capability on how to learn and build on 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 the things that you've learned because you've actually gone through a rigorous academic uh, environment for you know for six months or one year. Yeah, it's a great point that you bring up, you know, because uh, to me, it always seemed absurd that, you know, you learn up to 22 or 23. And then after that, I mean, pretty much you you just execute, right? I mean, it, it makes no sense at all. And what online education, MOOCs and edtech okay. did to us is that, you know, I mean, it, it made learning a lifelong process, right? I mean, you could pick up courses in a very piecemeal way and uh, learn what is actually required for you to, you know, progress uh, on, on your job, career, interest, etc., before we progress further on the operational side of things, right? I mean, I had one question on uh, being early in a category, you know, I mean, a lot of the founders perhaps listening to this podcast would be in categories that are just being formed in, you know, it's extremely nascent, a lot of ambiguity, a uh, lot of streamlining required, etc. right? And a lot of, you know, shifting the consumer mindset and so on. What would your advice be to such founders? Because, you know, you started in, in ad tech when, you know, it was, it was such a category, right? It was a very nascent category. So what should founders be aware of, uh, you know, in that case? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Roshan. Um, you know, a few things that I can talk about, right? For which I, it's not by, I don't think it's like a recipe for, you know, like a point by point part, you know, if you follow this, you'll exactly get, get what you're looking for. But I think a few things that work well for us and in general, I think is a, is a good, um, good set of guidelines. I think, um, you know, Number one, you need to have a clear differentiated offering, right? So I think uh, as we talked about in, my, in, our, in our journey as well, you know, we were looking around, we knew that the space was very, very exciting. We knew that the space was very interesting. There were players and generally, especially if you're working in a nascent uh, industry, I think, first of all, you need to make sure that it is a large enough market. I mean, you know, you're not going to build something where it's small, but then you know, it's, it's usually, it's usually a good idea to see what is it that you're doing different? Like, what is the problem that you are really solving that, as I talked about earlier, the problem that we clearly looked at solving was let's, let's create outcomes. Now that may not necessarily be something that you may be able to do for millions of people on day one, but can you go deep enough? Right? So with your differentiated offering for a set of people, can be however big it is. Maybe it's in your market. It's a you know, if it's if it's a SaaS company, maybe you need to do that only for five customers. But if it's a consumer company, maybe you need to do that for you know thirty people, as we talked about. We did it only for thirty people when we started. But for a set of people, can you go really deep enough and go so deep in your understanding of how to serve that customer segment? And if that customer segment is large enough, right? Many more people want that kind of an experience. Then you can actually scale your solution. 
So finding a differentiated solution in a large market in a, uh, is actually pretty, pretty critical. And that happens only if you actually go really deep enough by solving the problems that, um, that a set of customers really have. And, and so we really put in a lot of effort in solving the problems uh, of generating outcomes online for a set of, you know, in the, in, the, in the beginning, it was a small set of people. So we really looked at how we can get those outcomes to happen. The second thing I would say is, you know, as much as possible, and it is my experience, it's my philosophy. I think many people might disagree with it, but you know, my philosophy is as much as possible, don't raise money, right? So, you know, it completely changes the dynamic. Um, you know, my previous company, we had a lot of cash before we, before I came to Great Learning. You know, my previous companies, um, you know, we had a lot of cash, uh, but the pressures are very different where you have to show a uh, certain growth. You have to, you know, you have to prove the model pretty quickly. Uh, when I look at great learning, especially in the first uh, three, four years, we actually benefited a lot from the time that we had um, in being able to solve hard problems. All the things that I talked about were very, very hard problems. And I'm not sure if we had taken a lot of money from investors, they would have given us three, four, five years to solve those problems. Right. So uh, the bunch of us who started, we were pretty passionate about what we were doing. Uh, we weren't taking big salaries, but we, you know, put our head down and solve those problems and not having external capital forces you to be innovative and forces in a, you to really provide value to the customer. So for us, you know, we're a bootstrap company till the acquisition happened and um, all, all the money that we got was actually paid by customers. And that's a phenomenal way to build a, uh, build a business because you actually, you know, the customer is giving you feedback, right? Nobody's going to pay you anything in, unless you're providing that much value. Now, not all businesses can be built this way. And, and I understand that there are, there are different businesses. So I'm not, I'm not saying uh, that this is a, a way in which every business can be built, but as much as possible, at least to a point where you've completely nailed your unit of scale. Right. So where you know that, you know, now if you pour in money, it just, you know, the fundamentals are there. And the only reason why you need additional capital is for certain specific investments uh, that you're trying to make. But you've actually really solved the business problem issues. Right. So not getting carried away by everything that was happening around. Uh, you know, you may see that, you know, you know, on the news, companies are raising tons of money. Exits are happening. Uh, you know, founders are cashing out or employees are now getting big bonuses. So I think not getting carried away by all of that and staying kind of, you know, focused on um, solving the problem that you set out to do and having a runway for that. And uh, which is actually pretty, it's a, it's a pretty good idea. And the best way to create that runway is if you can get customers to pay for it and uh, plan your growth in such a way that you're largely reinvesting that money into the business. And you're also going to be very, very focused on uh, cutting your unwanted expenses figuring out ways to grow without spending too much uh, capital, uh, you know, on, on, um, on marketing because people operate at ridiculous CACs and then there's no way that business can sustain. So we were pretty sure they, you know, from the beginning itself, our CAC was within a certain margin and our growth, we will not go far faster than that. If our CAC was going to uh, go up and we are not going to be profitable. Similarly, you'll be very, very focused on cutting out all the excess fat that is there in the business, whether it's on people count or, you know, superficious, uh, superfluous, um, you know, investments in some office space or whatever, right? So really focused on. So I think that helps, especially, if, uh, especially if you are uh, early in, in your, um, in early in your journey, uh, there is a time for capital, but uh, having a lot of capital upfront, I think is just not a good idea. And I think that would be the uh, second uh, big thing. The third thing, and I'll, 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 I'll stop with this one. There's so many more, but I think the third one I would say is super critical is make sure that you have a, a team of very, very passionate folks, at least the two, three, four, five, initial five, six uh, folks that are there. Uh, we've been very lucky with, uh, you know, pretty much, I don't think anybody in our first 20 hires or, or the serious first 20, possibly even 30 or 40 first hires have actually left great learning, right? So we managed to uh, get people who uh, liked each other who enjoyed working with each other, who were, who were passionate about the mission of what we were trying to achieve. So I think, uh, because you are going to go through a lot, right? You're going to go through ups, you're going to go through downs, uh, and it's useful, uh, to be with people that you actually like and who share your vision and your, uh, passion. So, you know, having a longer term view of this, um, and not a very short term, uh, view helps a lot. So I think those were um, those were some of the learnings that I've had, and having a 
really good culture and that extends from the team that is there and creating a space where people want to as i said work on the work on the issues at hand um all of those will go go a long way in building a company that lasts and actually have a successful um successful like successful outcome you may not exactly do what you set out to do uh, but you will you will you know if you are in a space and you've got enough depth and you're going depth and you're going uh, you're trying different things i think you will eventually crack it because that's the nature of it there are there are many many problems to solve and you're not enough people attacking them with uh, enough passion this episode is brought to you by mulya you want to move fast sure but without breaking things now that's a hard ask the thing is once you have some base of users and customers you just cannot afford to risk uh, quality so how do the likes of greg swiggy and curefit you know some of india's fastest growing startups ship at lightning pace and delight their users and customers simple they are working with mulya as a strategic quality partner mulya is india's most talented and passionate community of testers they've helped prevent thousands of bugs and regression issues So as a CTO or a product owner if you want to reduce tech debt especially while you scale do check out mulya.com I've interviewed uh, Mulya's founder and CEO Pradeep on the podcast earlier and we spoke about how startups can improve quality while scaling and things to that effect you should definitely check it out I'll link to it in the description below now back to your regular program No for sure and uh... um i think that's such an important point that you bring up right multiple of those uh, uh you always run the business with an eye for profitability um and uh, you know what are some trade offs that you've had to make along the way with that kind of focus on profitability yeah so i think it comes down to you know uh, the question around the trade off from profitability and growth it comes down to the fact that you may have to trade off on growth and you may have to trade off on trying Uh, a few different things at the same time right and uh, that has its advantages and its uh, disadvantages the advantage of course uh, is that if you you know are focusing on the thing that is going to work and you know you are able to really put in energy there you maximize your chance of success but then of course if that path that you went down is turns out to be the wrong path you know then you lose a lot of time so i think it comes down to um, you know the trade off the trade off really comes down to that right are you going to be able to grow as fast as let's say uh, some of your competitors are 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 going to grow if they had a larger uh, corpus and they were trying many different experiments at the same time but i still want to you know i still would if if we were going to do this business again and uh, knowing everything that i know and if i were doing going to do another business at some point in the future i think i'll still again go the same you know it's just you know it's just a much better way of building a business which is profitable as opposed to you know just um trying a bunch of different things and you may get lucky with something that works uh, i would rather uh, build a profitable business and then uh, at a certain point when you cannot scale it any further without taking additional capital um, and then you know and then raise money at that point you know one of the other advantages of not having external capital and and being focused on profitability as we talked about earlier is that it will force you to provide value to your customer you are not going to be able to do foolish things right you cannot just spend money and acquire customers and provide more value than uh, you know so you're really focused on providing value to them otherwise they're not going to pay pay you and you're not going to be able to sustain yourself so having you know you, you just build a be- much better business by focusing on profitability and i think it's actually changed in india by the way these days a lot more focus is there on profitability than let's say 10 years back when uh, the companies first came out uh, and, and globally also i think there was a lot lot of experiments being done at that point where uh, it's about grow fast and then we'll worry about profitability later but i don't think that's the world that we're in today today i don't think you you really have a choice i think investors will definitely ask you uh, about your unit economics and 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 show profitability so it's not really a Uh, really a choice anymore right but you know just to push back on that right i mean we we see that you know edtech obviously has like so much headroom to grow not just in india but even internationally right and uh, because of the kind of margins that uh, you know are there in the business we've also seen a lot of funding coming into the ecosystem right i mean edtech has i think three unicorns right now and a bunch of them that might become unicorns in one more round of funding i suppose right uh again very different journey from the path that you took in 2013 14 to you know uh last year right uh what do you make of that 
Yeah. Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, exactly as you said, there is a lot of uh, funding that is happening in the industry right now. And I think it's also a point of uh, the industry maturing to a place where it's no longer about trying to establish the business model, right? So we've actually gone past that point and the companies that are getting funded, even uh, for us, they, 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 our ability to have, um, you know, made a, a, a sale happen and use the additional capital for certain growth plans is actually very appropriate at this point, right? And I think even the other companies that are getting funded and a lot of money flowing in right now is actually a function of the fact that right now the industry has matured to a point where there are specific activities that you can uh, you can perform with the additional capital. So, for example, the things that we you know you also suggested, you know, the money that we are using is to actually scale in international markets, right? We are investing a lot more into uh, into technology and building certain uh, kinds of um, uh, products that are helping people find jobs, helping people uh, and 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 moving into certain areas that we've not explored area, uh, earlier. So for example, we now have created a platform called Career Boost, which enables, uh, let's say, uh, students, uh, final year students to get access to jobs by uh, using the platform, right? And if they need to develop a certain skill set or get depth in a certain area, they can, they can take one of our courses. So there are specific areas where now we are investing in developing more capabilities around, similarly around content. So you know, we've gone to a point where our need to grow fast requires us to create a lot of content and then it requires us to invest a lot. So that once you get to a point where you're able to see that the unit economics makes sense, that, you know, this specific product priced at this area for this customer segment, that loop is working. And, you know, you are able to get a profit margin from whatever it is that the product that you're creating and selling. Now, Really, the additional capital is not just for, you know, let's say, marketing or adding people. Some of that is needed, but really you're using that, that capital for specific capabilities and investments that you're doing, which is going to help you grow. In our case, you know, we've grown significantly in international markets now where uh, nearly half the business is actually coming from markets such as US and LATAM and Africa and, you know, Europe and many, many different uh, countries. So all of that required us to, you know, ex uh, expand capital. But, you know, if you try to do that, let's say five years back, then I think we would have lost our focus and we would have succeeded neither here nor there. So I think the idea of capital, I'm not saying is bad. I think capital makes sense, but I think capital makes sense at a certain point in time where you're no longer raising that capital to establish your basic business model and your unit ec economics you're really using that capital to develop certain capabilities and uh, you're using that cap uh, capital with a for a specific need right so that's the way i would look at it and i think that's the way most edtech companies are able to raise money as well at least the companies that you're hearing about that is raising money have actually gone past that point of you know what is our business model how do we become profitable i think it's really about how do we uh, create, you know, get into a dominant position? And see, at that point, you have to play that game because then it becomes a different game, right? Now, if you don't have capital, you're not going to survive, right? Because, uh, you know, you will get outbidded on, on digital channels. You know, you will get out hired because, you know, people will start throwing extensive uh, job offers and with huge salaries and your competitor will take away your best talent, right? As if you've got certain uh, supply, as in our case, if there are faculty and so on, uh, they'll get lured away. So after a certain point, you cannot be in the game without actually being just as strong as your competitor is. So, so obviously you'll need to raise capital. So I would think of capital for these uh, few different purposes. One, of course, to invest in certain areas. Uh, and also you need that as a moat when the industry has matured and there are three, four strong players and you definitely want to be one among them, if not the, if not the number one among them. And at that point, capital is an asset and you need to have access to capital to survive and, 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 and succeed. Right. No, I think that's a great point. Again, I think uh, capital is kind of an accelerant, right? And beyond a particular point, you will not be able to force fit a product market fit uh, with capital, but you will be able to make whatever is repeatable uh, move that much faster, right? That whole flywheel can uh, move that much faster. Absolutely. Uh, so last year was... Last year was a milestone year for you. Uh, you got acquired by Baiju's, which is the lar largest edtech player in India. Uh, again, one of the stories that we don't hear too many 
uh, times, which is, you know, bootstrapped to 100 million plus uh, acquisition, uh, acquisition, right? Many hundred million plus acquisition, especially. So congratulations on that front. And uh, what changes post this acquisition for you and for great learning? Yeah, thank you, Roshan. You know, it's a, we've we've uh, we were very fortunate to have built a company that created that much value, right? So that's the way we uh, think about it. Uh, we were able to create create a company at a point where that exit, I'm sure, is creating value for everybody, for our employees, for the team that is behind it, uh, and of course uh, for Baiju's as well as we look to the future. And then um, you know, Baiju's wanted to build uh, a, a capability and wanted to build a uh, build a play. In, in higher education and in uh, professional up, upskilling sector. And then they're able to do that through great learning. And so I think the way uh, these stories, if they are successful, uh, it actually creates uh, value uh, overall for the entire ecosystem. And uh, I think that's what we've been able to achieve um, achieve as well. So, you know, I don't think of anything uh, specifically changing other in as far as our uh, core business is concerned in what we are, you know, getting up every morning to work on, which is to actually solve problems uh, in the space and through technology, through innovative uh, products and services, and uh, be able to scale that up and reach as many learners uh, as we can. As we talked about earlier, I think the R, you know, we are truly an Indian company that has actually made a global presence and, and we're very proud of that, right? So uh, we have learners from pretty much every part of the world um, now uh, more than 150 countries and uh, 3 million plus of them through a variety of programs reaching segments all the way from undergraduate students to, you know, people who are 50, 60, 70 years of old, uh, of age. So seeing that entire span and then providing services. So the way we are looking at this is, of course, after the acquisition, we have a lot more capital. We have a lot more resources, right? From a capital point of view, we don't have to now every six months or every year, go to the market and try to race around. Uh, Baiju's is deep pocketed, so we can use that and stay true to our mission of uh, creating products and services and grow as fast as we can and provide services around the world. Secondly, uh, we will continue to invest in uh, a lot more uh, things. Earlier, as I talked about earlier, when you're constrained by capital, you can pick only a few hits that um, you know you can work on, but now, uh, we are going to accelerate as much as much as possible in some of the areas that I talked about, different customer segments, different geographies, different types of products and services, you know, solving different needs, uh, creating additional content, enhancing our technology capability, all of that we are able to invest in and then set ourselves up for even faster growth um, in the next uh, next few years. So that's the part that really changes. If you were going at a certain pace, now we have the ability to go at a at a much faster pace. But other than that, uh, we are absolutely going to stay true to our mission and the way we built our business. Even today, we are talking about unit economics and profitability. We're talking about uh, our, uh, our learner satisfaction. So another thing, Roshan, that we are very proud of, as I talked about earlier, uh, is not just the fact that we have learners from all these different countries and um, segments, but also the fact that if you look at our ratings, whether it's on mouth shut or Google reviews, it'll be highest in the in the sector. So we're absolutely going to be razor focused on ensuring that they stay where they are and uh, there is no dip in our ratings, uh, dip in our completion rates, dip in our satisfaction rates, all of those, you know, we care very deeply about, we're passionate about that. So, um, so we're going to stay true to that. Uh, we're going to stay true to our fundamentals of good business and at the same time now have the capability to invest in certain areas uh, to grow faster and, and serve certain segments that we've not been able to in the past. Right. Fantastic. Uh, on a similar note, we're seeing huge consolidation in edtech, right? I mean, uh, I think Baiju's itself uh, made us something like 11 acquisitions last year. Um, you know, what do you see happening at the, at the same time? I mean, you also see, for example, teaching infrastructure evolve, right? I mean, for example, there is uh, teachment, uh, there is, uh, well, uh, Zoom and Razorpay itself solves plenty of uh, 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 infrastructure needs for teachers and so on, right? So, so I wonder, you know, the ecosystem will shape up in the coming years. Yeah, see, I think the whole aspect of uh, consolidation is very natural. I think that is, um, you know, that is part of it. So these are a couple of different uh, different questions. See, as far as consolidation is concerned, I think that is what is expected to happen, right? There are going to emerge large companies and there will be 
um, you know, integration across the across the space, as we've seen in other sectors, it's happening here as well. Uh, there are a few reasons for it. One, of course, is that um, there are uh, resources that can be leveraged. Um, you know, there is funding that typically ends up going towards the winner. So, uh, you know, so so companies will start backing the uh, the leading horse, so to speak. Or funds will start doing that and then, um, you know, they'll get disproportionate assets, whether it's funding, whether it's branding, whether it's uh, just access to talent. So it just makes sense for that to happen. And I think companies, after they get to a certain point in size, will have to take a call, right? Are you going to now uh, be able to do an IPO as an exit route? Or are you going to be able to continually raise multiple rounds of funding for a while? Or uh, is it the right time to exit and find a home? where you don't have to worry about your survival anymore because startups are like that, right? You're, you're, you are going to be in a, in a very dynamic space where it is a competition for the most successful uh, business model, the one that provides the most value and the one that is the most scalable and different businesses have different fundamentals and, and there is a nature. So, so I think uh, as founders and as business management, at, at some point you'll have to take a decision as to whether to raise additional capital and you'll be able to continue to do that, get an exit and so on, right? So I think that's as far as consolidation is concerned. And uh, we are in this sector, you are, we are seeing a lot of consolidation and I think it will continue to happen till a few large companies emerge. Now, in terms of a longer term view of future of education, see, I think this world is here to stay. I think edtech is here to stay without a doubt. And it will be how large parts of uh, education will be made accessible to learners at all segments, right? Be it in K-12, be it in uh, higher education, be it in professional upskilling, the entire value chain uh, will have access to more and more online and uh, technology enabled education. And I think that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing because um, as we talked about, uh, the biggest constraint in education has always been access to high quality faculty and access to high quality pedagogy and elements of good education. So what online is doing is that it's just democratizing the entire space and providing access to high quality, right? So, you know, earlier it would have been possible for you to run a poor quality institution, be it a, be it a college, be it a small coaching center, be it a small school and um, have poor teachers. Uh, and, and that's all that community would have had. And they would be able to charge a premium for it and then, uh, you know, provide a substandard service because there's nothing else. But that world will disappear. It will faster and faster disappear because you just have access to everything online at practically no cost. And, um, you know, it's a good thing, right? So uh, we are going to see more of that. Now, there are obviously challenges to that, um, you know, challenges being not everywhere. The infrastructure is just as good. Uh, there are uh, with technology, with internet, we've had internet issues today, but that is actually one of the bigger, biggest issues when it comes to uh, online education. Uh, how do you uh, consistently deliver uh, online uh, experiences? How will you engage learners, particularly the younger audience, it's hard to en engage them on an online platform. So I think it's still, still a lot of innovation needs to happen there, where it's not just going to be, but now really Zoom is the only platform that enables teachers to teach, but I think we will see more innovative gadgets where it will be a combination of, uh, you know, some virtual learning environments where you can actually experience being with next to each other. You can do things with your hands, you know, because none of those things are today possible, right? So, yeah. you know, and I think that is a limitation when, especially when it, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a young daughter and uh, asking her to sit in front, because that's how education is right now, asking her to sit in front of a Zoom session for an hour is impossible. If a teacher is sitting there and lecturing, she's walking away somewhere else. Because in the class setting, they're getting her to do things. They're engaging with the peers. So I think we will see more of those devices coming where people are going to engage with the device, with their peers, with their teachers in a very immersive environment. Uh, you know, so I think uh, those are, again, uh, things I'm waiting to see. Uh, but online education is here to stay. I also wouldn't say that all of education is going to be online. I think the aspect of physical interaction with each other, getting to see somebody, that energy of sharing a physical space um, is going to be uh, hard to replicate. So I, I do think that that's going to be central to it. But you will see more and more of this world coming where 
you know, poor, qual poor quality teachers won't have a place anymore, right? Those poor quality teachers will become facilitators who are largely going to use content that is available online, created by inspirational, high quality teachers. And they are going to use that to engage their, their, their students in a small setting, in a small village environment or a small local center. So that's a world that I envision where high quality content, high quality teachers, high quality pedagogy, instruments of learning, exercises are going to be accessible to everyone. And there will still be physical centers where one would go to where a teacher who's not necessarily an expert in the field will be able to uh, still engage and create an atmosphere where, because those things are also needed, right? So when I'm talking about, for an example, let's say learning mathematics, you know, how many great uh, teachers are there who can teach mathematics in our schools in India? There aren't that many, but there are so many fantastic uh, ma mathematics teachers, let's say at an IIT or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or an MNN Institute. So those teachers can create high quality content. But you also need that teacher in the class who's actually going to, you know, make, make that small group of 15, 20, 30 people engage with each other, make it fun, you know, solve their problems. So you'll have a combination of this, what we're calling as a flipped classroom approach where, you know, you're going home, you're consuming that content, you're learning from it, you know, you're preparing and then you're coming to class, you're working on a project together, you know, you're facilitating creative thinking and, and discussions and so on, right? We're not in that world yet. But I think that is what technology will, will take us to, where it will be a combination of all these elements of on, best practices of online learning, as well as physical, um, yeah, physical interactions and, and, and centers where meetings are happening. I think both of those things will be there. And there will be more of these gadgets and instruments that people will uh, work with each other on to, uh, make, to create a more immersive learning experience for everyone. So it's going to be pretty exciting. I'm, I'm sure of that. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm particularly excited about what it will enable the next 400 or 500 million users who are going to come on the internet, right? Because one thing is that access is such a key thing and uh, edtech is the only way, right? I mean, we're not going to create another thousand institutions of the caliber of, uh, you know, NITs or IITs and so on, but edtech is the answer. So uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, uh, Arjun. I mean, really, uh, I've got to experience what it was like in 2013 to, you know, the whole evolution up until now. Before we leave you, what are some books or podcasts that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, see, I like all the, you know, I like all the startup. I'm, I'm ultimately a startup guy. I, I love building businesses. That's what I've been wanting to do for the last 15 years and uh, try to learn how to do it. I came from a, you know, I was the first generation entrepreneur. I don't have any other folks who can, who taught me uh, business. So it's very much uh, learned from books, learned from actually working and had some great mentors, of course. But in terms of books, you know, the books that I like the most are, let's say the, the Lean Startup. It very much is part of our philosophy and my philosophy, Eric Rice. Um, you know, the hard things about hard things. It really talks about how uh, to build a business and, you know, deal with people issues and uh, take the tough decisions because when you're building a business, you have to. So Ben Horowitz, it's a great book to read. I'd recommend that for everybody. I think there's a good book called Traction. You know, it's a, it's one that uh, helps um, helps you see how to build companies uh, with you know really unlocking levers of growth. So that's a that's a book that gives you a step by step guidance on doing that. So uh, those are the, some of the books that I've uh, I've thought about on how to how to go about building your business. Also, you know, it's nice to read about founders and uh, successful companies. So, you know, the Elon Musk book, uh, Jobs, then uh, in terms of companies, I love reading about Netflix and Amazon, even the Indian companies, the, the Flipkart book, uh, you know, it just gives you a perspective on the journeys that all of them have gone through. Um, and I think uh, as a founder, as, uh, as, as part of the leadership of uh, any startup or any challenging high growth uh, company, I think you might end up uh, in a place thinking that, you know, what you're going through is unique. And I think uh, reading these books and going through it gives you the perspective that, uh, you know, you're not really uh, unique at all. In fact, everybody's gone through their own challenges and it helps you, um, you know, see through that. So that's how I've actually learned this, you know, through these two. In terms of podcasts, uh, I've uh, pretty much uh, listened to the entire uh, Reed Hoffman uh, Masters of Scale. Care. Um, so I think that's a fantastic series for anybody who again wants to learn about business. And the particular one that I like the most in that is um, is this. Uh, I think it's the uh, Airbnb one. I think a lot of people would have heard that. I think that's a good one. 
So, yeah, I mean, all of that, I think uh, for me, the most unique aspect of all of this is there's no one journey or there's no one magic recipe to succeed. There are general good principles to follow. Uh, and I think you should follow all of them. Uh, but there are many different ways in which you can build a successful company. And, uh, you know, different people have gone about it in different ways. But I think, uh, you know, if you're passionate about it and you stay long enough, it's going to happen. Awesome. Fantastic recommendations. And that's a great note to end the podcast on. Thank you again, uh, Arjun. And thank you for being so patient amid all the interruptions and everything. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Roshan. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators. Also follow the startup operator on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates. Stay safe, take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of the startup operator.